This program is brought to you by the Merdeka Award, an initiative to promote excellence by ExxonMobil, Petronas, and Shell. Hello everyone and welcome to the sixth Merdeka Award Roundtable. I am your host, Bettina Khan. Our topic today, Science Malaysia's Game Changer. The knowledge generated by undertaking research and studies generates potential and innovative solutions to problems or challenges. What you then have is new knowledge, new products, new technology, new services. This is the formula for wealth creation and economic growth. But how we get there is a different matter. The way science is taught and promoted is polarizing, and we're actually already late to this game. There are some changes to our format here on the Merdeka Award Roundtables, which are aimed at greater inclusivity. It's always been the intent of the Merdeka Award Roundtable to create an engaging forum for broad topics of policy and practice among the post merdeka generation. And so I'm delighted that with this roundtable, our members of the Young Scientists Network, Academy of Sciences Malaysia, to share their thoughts and questions with our panel. Let's get to them. With us today are two Medeca Award recipients, Tan Sri Datuk Dr. Yahya Awang, one of Malaysia's preeminent cardiothoracic surgeons, for his outstanding contribution to pioneering the development of clinical research and cardiac surgery in Malaysia, and also for his instrumental role in the establishment of the National Heart Institute, IJN. Emeritus Professor Datuk Dr. Lam Sai Kit who helms University Malaya's High Impact Research Centre, currently funded to the tune of 600 million ringgit. Dr. Lam received the Merdeka Award for his outstanding contribution to scholarly research and development in medical virology and emerging infectious diseases, including dengue. Dr. Ahmad Ibrahim is the Executive Director of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia, a body set up to promote the development of science, engineering and technology, provide a forum for the exchange of ideas and promote the role of science in nation building. And Rafida Abdullah. Rafida is a scriptwriter both for the film and television industry and an active lyricist in the local music scene. She's currently reading Criminal Justice at University Malaya, but the young viewers of Astro IQ don't know any of that. They just know her as the scientist on Astro's clever science-based game show. Welcome to the Merdeka Award Roundtable. It's a pleasure to have all of you here with us today. Um, Dr. Yahya, I'm going to come um, to you first and start with the whole sense of relevance, the relevance of this topic. Why has it become such a hot topic of late? Well, we are here today and the way we live today is largely due to the advances of science and technology, be it in the field of medicine, in the field of engineering, in transportation or telecommunication, science has brought us to where we are today. And science is going to improve and uh, advance by leaps and bounds in the next few years, in the next generation. And the way we lived is going to change tremendously through the advances of science and technology. Nonetheless, there's actually an inordinate amount of media covering this topic at the moment. So what's, what's happening that's causing so much interest? What's gone wrong? What scares you, Dr. Ahmad, the most when you look at the way science is developing Malaysia? Well, uh, in any country, the central issue is development. Malaysia is now at a stage where we can no longer compete with the low-cost countries. We have moved into a different status of development, where we're talking about high income, uh, a nation. So in this uh, area of development, we are now competing with more developed countries. And if you look at the cost of production, for example, we cannot, can no longer be a low cost country. So we have no choice but to go into more innovation led economy, where there's got to be a lot of investment in research and development to produce more high tech uh, sort of uh, business which can generate a higher income for the country. So let me follow up on that and ask um, Dr. Lam, 
why can't we just import this technology? Why is it so important that we have to develop the scientific capabilities in order to generate our own knowledge? I think it's a matter of pride too, you know, that uh, in our own country we must be able to be innovative and be able to do our own thing. I think just uh, getting transfer of technology is not sufficient in these days and time. Uh, therefore, uh, we must uh, try to do our own thing. Um, and it is possible. Uh, Dr. Ahmad Ibrahim mentioned that we are competing in a way with other developed uh, countries uh, and uh, a lot of people are in doubt that this is possible. But uh, maybe later on we'll share some thoughts with you that it is possible given the opportunity and the support from particularly the government, it is possible to do good science. I, I might open a can of worms here but are there certain sectors within the sciences in which you feel they are more crucially to be focused on at this point? The concentration at the moment is on bioeconomy and therefore the government is particularly interested in funding that type of research uh, which is, has more downstream application uh, coming uh, with products that are commercialisable. Uh, in the University of Malaya, we try to concentrate more on fundamental research which is very different actually and uh, the, the young scientists in the audience would appreciate. Downstream would be very applied type of uh, projects and upstream would be the fundamental type where if you do good science you end up with a Nobel Prize whereas if you do the downstream uh, you become a billionaire so that's the difference <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Yaya, are there certain sectors of the economy in which you think um, a big push into developing our scientific capabilities and capacities will benefit the nation? Yes, I, I feel that biotech is a big area that we should concentrate on uh, there are many devices that are used in our practice in medicine and these uh, devices are currently being imported. But if we can get our renowned institution that does a lot of research to collaborate with medical institutions, I think hopefully in future we can come up with our own heart valves, even with our own mechanical heart. Coming back to what I started out with, Rafida, when you're in your experience with your program in dealing with people in the production of that. What worries you most about the status of science in this country? Um, what worries me most is that there is actually uh, quite a large gap between uh, science practitioners and the lay person, the person on the street. Most people would think that science is something uh, very much divorced from their lives. But it is actually very relevant and now more than ever, I mean, uh, just for the past 100 years or so, there has been an unprecedented human population explosion. And um, it's really important for us to develop science literacy, especially uh, just people in general. They need to know why uh, we need to um, adopt more uh, earth-friendly practices, why we need to not use so many of the Earth's resources. I see so many of uh, people who are uh, my age or younger uh, students, they don't really understand the need to control their impulses when it comes to uh, purchasing things, when it comes to consuming things, and actually it all boils down to what they understand about us, about the earth, about uh, how um, what we do every day affects everything in our environment. And so it's understanding what Rafida is talking about in a scientific matter, what is missing today? I think that uh, we should now move towards cutting-edge technology. In the past, we have been recycling technology uh, and we have not been innovative enough. And this could be due to the research funding that uh, we have received in the past. Uh, we are still, at the moment, the country uh, is devoting only a very small percentage of our GDP uh, in science, 1.07% uh, as compared to Singapore. Singapore is 2.8%. And uh, the developed countries, Korea and Japan, way above 3%. So if we are really serious about wanting to have cutting-edge research and uh, good science, we need to put money where it should be. Dr. Ahmad, I know you were involved in the drafting of the updated science and technology policy for Malaysia. Yeah. Um, is some of what we've just talked about being addressed or being looked at by the government? Yes, very much so. In fact, uh, before that, I just want to touch on this question of importing technology. Actually, uh, we need to, as they say, make some and buy some. 
But in order to buy some, we need to have the capacity to choose which technology that we want to bring in. That means we need to have a very strong scientific foundation. Otherwise, we may choose the wrong technology. And there are many out there who are actually looking for uh, you know, countries to buy technology maybe already defunct, already outdated. So we need a very strong uh, human capacity to not only undertake research and develop new technologies, but to know which technology we should bring in for the country. On the science policy, uh, the cabinet has just uh, uh, approved the new policy uh, developed by the Ministry of Science. And this is actually based on the six pillars and it's mainly to address the, the shortcomings that we have now in the country in moving science for, for national uh, development. Uh, the six pillars, first is research development and commercialization which is a big issue, it has remained a challenging issue for many years where research is not going to the marketplace and the talent, that is the second pillar. We need to actually invigorate our scientific talent and now there is concern that among the school children there is a decline interest in science which is worrying. Governance is another one because we need to actually have a good uh, coordination among institution and, and good collaboration so that because science, investment in science is a cost, is a very high cost like Professor Lam was saying that uh, we need to actually uh, streamline the, the work by the different institutes. Uh, I, I want to go in depth in a little bit more into what you're saying but I'm going to take the show to a quick break for the moment. Um, we will come back after this commercial break for much more including how to get young people fired up about science. You're watching the Merdeka Award Roundtable. dan ikuti kami dengan analisis tidak hanya berita dalami fahami luaskan pandangan astroawani.com Welcome back, everyone, to the sixth Merdeka Award Roundtable, which is taking place at Petra Science, a stimulating, fun, and interactive environment. Petronas created it for Malaysians in the hopes that it would promote a passion for acquiring scientific knowledge. Thousands of students visit Petra Science every year, and through its exhibits, are motivated to become more inquisitive and curious about the world around them, in particular, lead the world of energy. Elsewhere, however, in the student world, all is not well. PISA stands for Program for International Student Assessment, which measures the ability of fourth form students in problem solving and their literacy in reading, mathematics and science. Since 2009, Malaysian students have failed to record any improvement in any subject. So we come back to this question of students' performance, which you alluded to a little bit e earlier. Um, I think the latest result from PISA was that this sort of heart-stopping number of 60% percent 
do not show any proficiency uh, in mathematics. 43% don't make the grade in science. And so our Malaysian students at fourth form level are lagging behind cohorts in Singapore uh, and in Thailand, and apparently they're even being taken over by students from Kazakhstan. So, so what is causing this sort of trifecta of misery? Science has to be made interesting in terms of learning science. So at Academy, we are now actually very aggressively promoting what we call the inquiry-based science education. And this is based on a number of models developed in France and even in, in China. They have what they call hands brain. They're trying to bring in this new way of teaching science and learning science where there is a lot more participation from the students rather than just uh, uh, you know, the teachers uh, dishing out whatever uh, needs to be learned. Dr. Lam, can I ask you a so slightly personal question? Tell me about the best teachers you had, because I think it's one mm. thing to provide students with all these gadgets. We've got some behind us, bits and bobs to play around with and try and come up with something like that. But surely <coughs> teachers play a really important oh, extremely role. Extremely so. Uh, I think that uh, whatever they do, they must have a passion for what they do. If you're a teacher teaching science, you must show that passion in your work. That will be a good communicator to the students. If you're just teaching it for the sake of earning a salary, it is not going to work. And the students can detect all this very, very well. Uh, so therefore, uh, in whatever we do in life, I think we must love what we do. Uh, and uh, that is the most important uh, attitude. So with coming back to this whole sense of um, we, need, we need to teach our young to love science, there is an end game to this. Don't you think that we have perhaps within our system need to start identifying earlier or find ways of identifying earlier children who have an aptitude for science? Oh yes, that is very much part of the IBSE program, uh, the inquiry-based science education. We had a number of projects with primary schools and even in the Permata program, they have also introduced this as one of the elements. But uh, Actually, there are a number of other factors which influence the decision to take up science or not. Of course, parents also have a, uh, no, no, a role to play. <laughs> I was just about to ask Dr. Yahya, did yeah. your parents tell you you were going to be a cardiologist? Or was there something that happened in your school life, interaction with teachers, uh, something else, which, it, which you said, okay, I'm going to devote my life to science? No, I don't think my father uh, <laughs> influenced me in any way, but I do come from a family of doctors. And uh, I was naturally um, brought into the stream and I was interested in science from the very young, at a very young age. And uh, I think what the final turning point was I had good teachers who taught me good chemistry, good physics, and I could understand it. And uh, I thought science was fun and I enjoyed it. And it's because of that, I think, I floated into the stream of medicine. Afida, your, your program is all about uh, encouraging and exciting children uh, about science. So television does certainly have a role to play, but it's actually, for the viewer at home, it's still passive learning. Mm -hmm. you know, in your experience with the children in the studio when you're doing something, do you find the hands-on forum really works to get them engaged? Actually, they do like uh, doing things, uh, doing experiments, but I find that the experiments being conducted in schools, uh, they seem very rigid and very focused on getting a certain result out of that experiment in order to teach the kids something in order for them to pass their exams, which is actually... Um, I feel that it defeats the purpose of conducting an experiment. You know, children need to learn that in some experiments, you will get uh, the result or the outcome that you predicted. And in some experiments, you will not, that it's okay to be wrong. I find that in my experience with children, uh, the biggest stumbling block is that our kids, Malaysian kids, they are very, very fearful of being wrong of losing face, of being embarrassed, and therefore they don't, um, they don't try and they don't uh, offer theories, they don't give ideas because they don't want to be wrong, they don't want to be embarrassed in front of uh, their peers. And um, this is something that we really need to work on because a large part of science work, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, a large part of science work is about being wrong. You know, if you can't get past your 
first hypothesis that has been proved wrong, you're going to have a very short-lived career. So children need to be taught that it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to offer views and uh, later find that it has been disproved. Uh, it's okay to think up new ideas and, and uh, basically it's all right. It's part of learning. They need to learn that. I think that taps into one of the biggest problems that we've we have with the commercialization of the knowledge that we've got from science. If you don't inculcate in children and subsequently they don't carry this through into adulthood, this sense that um, I need to be able to dream, I need not to be afraid uh, of failing, I have to have a sense of adventure, then you can't get from Nobel to billionaire, can yes, you? That's right. In fact, science, uh, to me, a scientist is like an entrepreneur because he has to take risk. When you go and look at new things, you have to take risk. And when you take risk, there will be some failings, there will be some success. But the problem we had in the country is we tend to look more at success. We're trying to hide the, the, the failings. And this is not very good because some of the breakthrough in science actually come from the failings. Yeah. I give an example. Uh, I'm also associated with this Fraunhofer organization in Germany. You know the MP3? It did not come from a deliberate research looking for MP3. It came as a spin-off from the feeling. So I think uh, our Prime Minister went to California and he came back with the uh, view that we must actually have a culture of tolerating failures and learning from the failures. Uh, in science, if we can inculcate that kind of culture, then I think we are there in terms of building the appreciation that's a big cultural leap yes. though i think that that this. we have to make because we you know we've 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 got this and i'm sure there are certain ideas perhaps our studio audience will be able to uh, share with us their thoughts on how we can encourage more uh, innovative thinking and more behavior uh, in our students so we'll go to the break for the moment we'll return to hear exactly those comments and observations from the scientists in the audience the best way out? The highway or an alternative road? Decisions, decisions... Toys! Did I bring enough toys? Yeah, I think so. Now, where did I put those sweets? Okay... Make a good choice you don't have to think about. Choose Shell Fuel Save 95 with active efficiency ingredients. It's designed to last longer per tank. Right, Karen knows the way. Ah, <sighs> GPS it is. Shell Fuel Save 95, designed to last longer per tank. Buletin Awani 12 tengah hari. Kami seluruh warga kerja Astro Awani akan melaporkan kepada anda apa yang berlaku sepanjang hari ini di dalam negara maupun luar negara. Sebenarnya harapan masih tinggi, operasi mencari dan menyelamat MH370. Kerajaan sebenarnya memandang serius ya tentang permasalahan projek perumahan terbengkalai ya. Dan apa yang kami akan sediakan hari ini adalah bagaimana import dan juga ekspor produk daripada China hmm. tidak akan terjejas akibat dengan insiden hmm. MH370. Buletin Awani 12 tengah hari di Astro Awani. Welcome back everyone. One way to facilitate excellence in sciences, leverage the vast knowledge and resources in the private sector. Shell Malaysia, a co-founder of the Merdeka Award, recently extended its sponsorship of an academic chair in petroleum geosciences at University Technology Petronas. It's testament to the commitment from Shell towards accelerating learning and harnessing the best talents for the industry. We're now going to invite our studio audience, scientists and fellows of the Young Scientists Network to present questions to our panelists on this topic of science, a game changer for Malaysia. All right, here is your chance. This is your opportunity for your voice to be heard. Do I have any questions? Now, um, as much as we know, this year is um, the commercialization year. And a lot of effort is given um, and, and focus is given by the government just to commercialize uh, products within the country. Now, my question would be, are there new mechanisms and incentives that are being put in place to ensure research for the benefit of the nation, particularly with an equal focus on fundamental research 
and commercialization. Dr. Lam? If I may, I'd like to take yes. that question because this is exactly what we are trying to do in the University of Malaya. Uh, some of you may know that we have been given this very substantial grant to do high impact research uh, and that is to turn up tier 1 ISI papers, which is very important for the ranking of the university. Uh, but besides that, I would like to think that some 40% of the projects that we are funding actually have impacts to society, and that is very important. They come up with patents that will help the bioeconomy of the country. Uh, we come up with uh, products that are very important for the health sciences. Uh, we think that some of the projects that we have uh, actually gets uh, what I call touching lives. The effect is touching lives and impacting society, and that's very important. So if we have, for example, uh, the development of a prosthetic limb, that's going to help very much uh, the community, those who have uh, this problem of losing the legs through amputation or through accidents. Uh, that's only one of the examples that uh, we can cite to you, but there are many, many such uh, uh, research that's going on, which is not only fundamental, but also uh, downstream applied. Hello, I'm Miko. I studied biotechnology in New York. Uh, so in the US, uh, just now you, all of you talk about uh, getting kids to learn how to fail, that it's okay to fail. In the US, we have, uh, they have this culture called garage inventors. So, okay? so you see like Google, companies like Google, Apple, Hewlett Packard, all came from the garage. Okay? With the trend of Malaysia having more high rises than houses with spaces. Okay? How does it affect, uh, could, or rather, could we inculcate this garage inventor culture in Malaysia. Okay, we might have to talk to property developers about that for literally, <laughs> but <laughs> garages in the sky. Uh, but I, I think I know where you're coming from. Um, yeah, Dr. Yahya? garage, uh, of course, this is one of the approach that is used in many developed countries to promote uh, uh, sort of innovation among the community. And they are still taking the risk. And, uh, but on commercialization, we must remember that Commercialization is not just for money. Commercialization means the technology is used by society at large, then it's commercialized. And it's very difficult to get a sustained commercialization of applied research if you're not investing in the fundamental. Okay. So this is something that we need to look at. There must be a good balance in terms of allocation of resources for basic research and for applied research. Because without the strength in fundamental research, you'll soon dry up of ideas in applied research. I think, I think what you say is quite interesting because everyone sort of credits Steve Jobs, for instance, with revolutionizing our lives. But he actually didn't invent all those technologies, did he? He just collided them all into this one thing and decided, you know, um, everybody wants that SMS technology and that camera technology and that video technology and all that in one device. So he, he collided it. So I think the basis yes, of what you're saying right. is that this fundamental, fundamental scientific knowledge, is knowledge has to be there. So, like Steve so that Jobs, you can go into the garage. Steve Jobs, he yeah. saw there is some unmet needs in the market. Then he looked at what are the possible knowledge platform that he can bring together to create this technology on smartphones and everything. And uh, that he is doing applied research, but he has to depend on a very strong knowledge base. So this comes from basic research. Good evening. So my question is that, um, what sort of plan do we have to ensure more effective delivery system for human resource to drive economic growth and progress for our country? Uh, do you face human resource problems, Dr. Yahya, at IJN? Well, in medicine and in IJN, initially we did. But over the years, we have uh, harnessed and trained a lot of young doctors, a lot of doctors who are now going into innovative research, clinical research. So initially we have a short of uh, talented uh, people, but IJN now we, ha we do have uh, uh, qualified, talented doctors who are now going into techni uh, technical advances in uh, biotech. And we are working, IJN is working with universities to develop uh, biotech. So that's specifically for your field, but in general, human resources, Dr. Uh, Ahmad, in what is it? In academic science, we are trying to raise the profile of research scientists as a profession. Because now research scientists is not looked up as a profession. Unlike you know, engineers or uh, doctors, so parents actually see this as profession.
So at the academy, we are looking at uh, raising this profile. We have this program called Top Research Scientist Malaysia, where we actually uh, uh, get scientists to put in their uh, contributions and we make an assessment whether they are among the top tiers of research scientists in Malaysia. And we get the Prime Minister every year to give them the certificates. So we want to raise this profile. But more important, I think, we need to actually have a, a research scientists going through a proper uh, course program to become a research scientist. Not everyone should be a research scientist. They have to go through a program, then it become a profession that is recognized. Then I think it will help uh, uh, parents to make the decision whether to get their children to do science. I, I actually, sorry, go ahead. I think uh, in medicine, there are many doctors and a lot of them are doing basically clinical work. Yes. But the time has now come for them, some of them, to go into clinical research or uh, technological research. Uh, in Malaysia, I know that the majority of doctors are basically doing clinical work. Few are going into research. And I think it's important that we, in future, we train doctors who are research-oriented. And so our curriculum, our, our intake of our medical students would have to relook into this aspect. Um, how do we... How do we tell young, ambitious, driven people that the life of the white coat is as exciting as somebody who's deciding to build their career in social media? What, what, why does it rock for you? <laughs> All right, so I'm Dave from UPM. So uh, I think it basically uh, deals with the passion. You know, you got to tell to them that um, it's just a stepping stone to be an entrepreneur. You know, you want to be successful, but it comes deep down to what you want to be and what you want to be, um, you know, what you really want, your passion of science, of to learn everything, you know, like what you want to know about it. So I think that's passion is the key word. Thank you. Dr. Lam? I think that's very true, you know, that uh, if you're very passionate about it, the dollars is secondary. Uh, we have quite a number of very young scientists you know, and some of them actually came back from overseas where they were earning big bucks from USA, from UK and they come back to Malaysia because we are able to attract them by telling them we have money for good science. Now in the developed countries uh, in Europe as well as uh, in US, the situation of funding is not so good nowadays and as a matter of fact, no, we are able to have better funding than some of these uh, 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 institutions overseas. Uh, and the fact that we have got fantastic instrumentations, which have spent a lot of money to build up, you know, uh, and good science, they're actually coming back. Even Nobel laureates, and three of them, are working with us uh, because uh, you know, they appreciate the fact that uh, we are able to contribute a lot towards the research. So it's not just a one-way transfer, but it's actually a mutual uh, benefit. Um, may I know how successful is Talent Corp in this in terms of uh, the number of returning scientists and how do we actually balance this with the local scientists in Malaysia? The thing is we do not have to physically bring them back home. We need to actually uh, decide, for example, some key projects that we are doing. Then we look at what is available out there in terms of our scientists. Then we connect with them. Because by being out there, they are actually having the, the luxury of linking with top scientists out there, the facilities. So we should not just be thinking about bringing them home, but to actually use them as part of a project uh, sort of team. Then I think we, we can benefit more rather than... Let me just jump Please in at you, this stage. Uh, we are actually working with uh, some very good, uh, talented Malaysians overseas. They're not prepared to come back at this stage for family reasons, for children's education reasons, uh, and for various other reasons. But they want to contribute towards science development in Malaysia. And we have got very good relationships with uh, our own scientists, Malaysian scientists, doing extremely well in Australia, in UK, and in USA. So they stay where they are, but they continue to collaborate with us, give us ideas, and from time to time to come over, stay for short stints, and then help transfer technology. I think that's the way to go. 
Okay. I would like to know what are the broader current initiatives um, to engage the young scientists and the R&D stakeholders um, to become part of the discussion and uh, to then be really involved in establishing the policy and the framework, as well as perhaps advice on how we young scientists should perhaps strike a balance uh, when we try and make our views relevant. Thank you. One of the pillars is actually enculturation and trying to get the culture in science. So academy, we, that's one of the reasons we have established Young Scientist Network. They're supposed to do the work of actually influencing the young. But at the same time, we have started a, a sort of discourse with uh, MPs, Member of Parliament. We want science to be mainstream. We want discussion on science to be in the lawmaking uh, platform. And we have started this and we have brought in uh, MPs to discuss with us some of the issues in science. But more important, under the pillar, because enculturation is not something that is, uh, can be achieved in one or two years, there must be a plan, a long-term plan, to actually uh, 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 have programs to build the culture. So this is what we have actually advised the ministry, to come up with a proper long-term plan. Because you cannot build a culture in one, two years. And this has to be properly monitored. And uh, I think even if we make use of the NGOs in science, you know, this can be something effective in actually spreading the culture. Surely, Rafida, television and social media are very good platforms if you are going to try and enculturate. Yes, that's true. Uh, and actually, I'm very happy to see that there are a lot more science programming, especially local science programming, that's being done uh, by the local TV stations. But uh, I don't think that um, what we have right now is enough. Um, I think one of the main problems is that um, children absorb things from adults. And a lot of adults have this attitude that science is dull and difficult. And uh, this is being reinforced in schools where uh, science, uh, science subjects are being taught to only the smart students. So you have the streaming where the poor students or the students who don't do well go into arts and the smart students go into uh, the science stream. Uh, I think this creates uh, this... Uh, this viewpoint that science is something very special that only special people can do and uh, for kids out there it's very difficult once they get into their heads oh i don't have the aptitude for science they don't think that they will ever uh, understand science or uh, be able to use science in their lives uh, and i think that uh, really we need to uh, we need to create a much more literate uh, society in terms of science uh, what science does for you in your everyday life, etc. Um, there's this story that I read recently, uh, recently um, on BBC, I think. Uh, this guy in southern India, he's actually a school dropout. But uh, what he did was he revolutionized the menstrual health care in southern India for poor women. And he's known as the menstrual man. And, you know, he, he, he doesn't have that much of uh, scientific knowledge. But because he was so driven, so uh, inquisitive and uh, so innovative, he wanted to really help the people around him. His wife, his mother, you know, they were only using rags. They were using leaves uh, as, you know, um, menstrual aids. Uh, he decided, no, no, this is not good enough. I will do this. I will help the women around me. And he did. And, you know, he used to go around his village uh, wearing a football bladder filled with goat's blood <laughs> just to test out these uh, pads, menstrual pads that he was creating. And, you know, his wife left him, his mother <laughs> left him, but you know, he, he wasn't put out. I will do this, he said. And that is the spirit that we want to inculcate. The spirit that, you know, I can know if I want to know. Nothing is beyond me to know if I really want to. This is what we need to teach children. I think there's a lot of move right now in, in the edu general education circles um, to have this sort of cross education. So if, even if you were doing English literature, you might be reading a passage from sciences or something like that, so that people can start to kind of almost kill two birds with one stone. We will take everyone to a much needed break and be back shortly with more of the Merdeka Award Roundtable.
Isnin hingga Jumaat, Astro Awani membawakan Bisnes Awani 4 kali sehari. Kos pembinaan lapangan terbang antarabangsa Kuala Lumpur 2 KLA 2 dijangka RM4 bilion. I believe it's within the budget. Projek pembangunan bercampur bersepadu mewah Perdana Ki di Pulau Langkawi. Kerajaan sasar 7,000 tenaga kerja sektor pembinaan dari Indonesia akan dilahirkan selepas menyertai program latihan pembinaan. Isnin hingga Jumaat, Bisnes Awani di Astro Awani. Welcome back everyone. The third of the Medeca Award partners, ExxonMobil, collaborates with the Academy of Sciences Malaysia to stage the National Science Challenge for high school students across the country. English is the language of science and to enhance proficiency among school children, ExxonMobil has also helped to establish English resource centres in Trangano. Such efforts though need to take place within a well-constructed and executed framework if Malaysia is going to develop as a society that supports and believes science and technology is the basis for building a culture of invention, innovation and tech-driven entrepreneurship. What are some of the ideas that are going to get us there? I'm going to come back to you, um, Dr. Ahmad, because we, we've, you've been talking a little bit here and there about um, the pillars. Mm. We also have a lot of programs and boards and foundations and chairs and universities all addressing every facet uh, of scientific study. But it doesn't seem like we operate in a terribly cohesive system. Is that a fair statement and is something being done to address it? Oh, yes, very much so. In fact, in the pillars, one of the pillars I mentioned is governance, where we need to streamline all this. And under enculturation, for example, promoting science, we need to have a long-term plan, a five years or ten-year plan, where uh, there is involvement from all these parties are properly uh, monitored and uh, strategized. Now, I think uh, there are a lot of ad hoc work on promotion, which uh, does not lead to much. For example, one year you have a good program on building awareness, the next year you have no budget for it. And this cannot happen. It has to be a continuous program. That's why in uh, academic science, we are promoting the creation of a science channel. This is actually along the lines of TV Al-Hijra. Because science, as we rightly saw, is a game changer and it's important for Malaysia to invest in science. And this is the only way if we are to actually get uh, the community interested, motivated to take up science. So one idea that has been floated at the academy is to actually to uh, persuade the government to allow the creation of this very dedicated science channel. I hazard a guess, Dr. Lam, that you and Dr. Yahya, being very busy people, probably see each other at Hari Raya and Chinese New Year, which is kind of indicative of the problems that's faced within the scientific community. Is there a way for the collaboration, the meeting of the minds and the time to happen in a space that currently doesn't exist? Both uh, uh, Tan Sri and myself, we are fellows of the Academy of Science Malaysia, so we do meet... Oh, you do? <laughs> ...a bit more than just twice a year. Well, this was me uh, failing and trying to be and, creative. And uh, the ASM has actually <laughs> organised a lot of dialogue sessions and then we do uh, get the young people involved in the discussion. I think that's very important. I think we need to hear the voice of the young uh, in order to make teaching of science relevant to them. Uh, otherwise, it will be something that's very dry and it will be of no interest to them. Uh, so I think the dialogue sessions are very useful. Uh, and it's multidisciplinary because you can get social scientists. We have a program, uh, we have a research project on uh, the problems of the aged. And that really you know, uh, involves uh, all types of disciplines, from social scientists to policy makers to the health sector and so on. And that's uh, very good. You know, and that's a platform where we can sit down together and discuss uh, about that. But all of that has to operate within a certain framework. Sure. You've mentioned the pillars within that framework. Um, in order for those pillars to continue standing and supporting that framework, uh, there's going to have to be certain resources put, to it, put into it. Funding is one of them and the support system is another. Do we actually, 
at the moment have the people to support the framework. I'm not talking about the scientists, but the enablers who are going to make things happen, not just on a higher impact research, not just in one area, but throughout the entire science and technology ecosystem. In fact, one of the key elements in science is actually the ideas, the ideation. Because if you start with the wrong idea, then you end up with the wrong output. So at the academy, we have created, since uh, the President Tan Sri Tajuddin became president, we created the platform called Idea Exchange, where we discuss topics of interest to the country and get fellows, associates and young scientists to come and share their views. And from these ideas, then we move to a more detailed study to generate the advice to the government. So ideation, we have always pushed for ideation to be part of the research value chain. The ideas must be, studies for idea generation must be funded, just as you fund research. But, be, uh, so I'm sorry to interrupt, but what I'm trying to get at is here is, say I'm a scientist and I have an idea for research, I have to go somewhere to the government for um, the funding. And so are there enough qualified people in, at government administrative level, as we see it today, to actually facilitate where we want to be in science. So it's not just having, on one hand, clever scientists, you need some really good administrators as well. I think uh, there are many in government uh, who plays this role. But I think the basic issue, one of the problems, is the bureaucracy. To get it through and uh, to have an idea, to get it through the, uh, the government, to get the funding, takes a long, long time. And I think the bureaucracy sometimes uh, dampens the spirit. Going to take I, I was going to say, in, in countries like Korea or Taiwan, uh, where it involves very basic fundamental science, it's all managed by scientists under the Academy of Science. In Taiwan, is uh, Academia Seneca. They actually do the evaluation and also the approval of ideas for funding for research. So there is another agenda that we are pushing at the academy to get the government to actually put all the coordination of fundamental research under the purview of the Academy of Science. Because we are more independent, we are more stable because our fellows is for life. You know, If you go to the government ministry, they, uh, some of the people may not stay there forever. They move through ministries. By academy, you're assured all the fellows are for life. So we have a very stable group of people who can evaluate and approve research projects. I'll allow you that plug. We're going <laughs> to take um, a quick uh, break right now and come back with our final segment here on Science, the Game Changer for Malaysia, coming up next with reflections on some of the other shifts that we might have to make. the best way out? The highway or an alternative road? Decisions, decisions... Toys! Did I bring enough toys? Yeah, I think so. Now, where did I put those sweets? Okay... Make a good choice you don't have to think about. Choose Shell Fuel Save 95 with active efficiency ingredients. It's designed to last longer per tank. Right, Karen knows the way. Ah, <sighs> GPS it is. Shell Fuel Save 95, designed to last longer per tank. Berita anda, suara anda, secara langsung, bila-bila masa, kongsi dan ikuti kami dengan analisis tidak hanya berita, dalami, fahami, luaskan pandangan. AstroAwani.com Welcome back, everyone, to the Merdeka Award Roundtable. At the end of January this year, heart surgeons from Institute Jantung Negara performed a non-invasive procedure to remedy a disorder known as mitral valve regurgitation, which is when the heart's mitral valve doesn't close tightly, causing blood to flow backward into your heart. Now, that surgery was a world first. It was a phenomenal achievement. But the device used, that device itself, came from the US, made by a company that develops therapies for structural heart diseases. 
And I think that is what I'd like to lead into because it encapsulates for me a lot of what we've talked about. I think that's what you're saying. Yes. That's the caliber of scientists that we want. Not the one that just performs the procedure, but the scientist that invents the device. True. Yeah. I think when we first uh, envisaged the establishment of the National Heart Institute, we had a vision, and that vision was quite clear that it should be a center of excellence. Not only in service, not only in doing surgery, but also in uh, technology advancement. And uh, over the years, we are almost there. I think IJN now has to concentrate on uh, new technologies. They have to work with uh, industries. They have to work with multinational industries. And maybe now we are doing, we are working with local universities who have expertise to work on uh, devices like this, procedures like this. This is uh, uh, forefront technology. Of course, it's the first in the, country, in, the, in the world, in fact, and we have to wait for a few more years to see what the results is like. But this has put IJN uh, in the forefront, and this is what we envisage IJN to be, a center of excellence, not only for service, but also in uh, technology advancement. And uh, one of the areas now that IJN is going into is to work with the local university, UTM. They're harnessing the strength of each UTM is strong in bioengineering, biotechnology, whereas IJN is strong in clinical work. Together, and if we could bring an industry into it, then hopefully we will come up with certain devices that are used regularly in cardiovascular uh, uh, diseases, management of cardiovascular diseases. And uh, I'm hopeful that with such innovation, such uh, technology, that we will be uh, able in the future, perhaps, to produce our own devices and even export them. And I'm hopeful that, say, in 10 years' time, we will have a Malaysian-made mechanical heart. Inshallah. <laughs> I think what, 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 have you, what, what you say uh, comes back to what we talked about, about having vision. I think it's what the management strategy is all called, the blue ocean strategy. But Dr. Ahmad, we can't be all blue ocean and vision here because as somebody in the audience pointed out, we face a real shortfall of scientists. So how do we strike the balance between having these sorts of wonderful blue ocean strategy thinking and actually making sure that we have the soldiers? No, because... Uh, <clears throat> As Tan Sri was saying, we need to look forward. And uh, that is how we generate ideas. Science should be an instrument of building new industries. For example, under the academy, we have this mega science platform where we look at all the industries that are relevant to the country's economy, the future in 40 years' time. What will be the risk faced by this industry? And what are the opportunities? And how can investment in science will mitigate this risk and capture the opportunities? In fact, under the health sector, one of the key areas we identify is this medical devices. These are areas that we need to invest in, but we need to build a capacity for it, and we need to plan on a longer term, because we cannot. This thing cannot happen over one, two, three years. If you no. look. Yeah. Exactly so if you right. Look at Korea, so, so the question to uh, you is: these the, the the frameworks that you're devising, the policies yes. that the government is putting together, um, does that take into account that an investment of this nature has a very long lead time? That the it, you know it took I think if I'm not if I'm not wrong, um, sustain agriculture to move from sort of the subsistence farming to where we are in agriculture right now is like a 50-year lead. Yes. Tin mining, it took 40 yeah. years to get to the top of the game. Yes. Uh, politicians aren't very patient people. <laughs> so that's Lam, why. Dr. Lam has. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there is a huge investment, which is what I'm talking about. There is a, a shift in thinking mm -hmm. that we need to make here for the sciences. And it, it seems to come from every level, from parents to students to the people who are people who are in charge of building that framework i think that um, we have to listen to what the funding body wants you know and unfortunately they want immediate gains and they do not give us enough lead time to do what we think uh, we need you know 10 years 20 years some of the uh, outputs of science you know takes many many more years than what the government says now within three years you must produce all these all these products or, or papers you know but that's not science you know we should take our own pace and do good science and not be constrained by just because the funding body wants it this way.
That was your final thought, Rafida. Final thought? Um, I would really like to see the field of science being opened up uh, more to lay people, uh, for children to understand that everything, everything, all experiences in life revolve around science or has a scientific base. Uh, and of course, for children to have this attitude, adults also have to have this attitude. So I really hope that there will be a seismic change. And really, I don't know how that's going to happen, but I really hope it will happen. All hands, I think, have to be on deck for mm -hmm. that one. Final thoughts, Dr. Ahmed? Yeah, I think uh, we do not want to have all Malaysians to be scientists. What we want is science literacy among all Malaysians. You can be an accountant, you can be a lawyer, but you appreciate the wonders and the strength of science, then I think that will be something good for the country. Well, I think science is so important that science is going to take us the next, uh, to the next level. I think maybe it's time for us to have a crystallized a vision for science, like a vision 2020. Maybe we have, should have a science vision for 20 years and see what we can achieve over that period. Okay. And with that, we come to the end uh, of our program. We have run out of time. We could talk, I think, for another 20 years on this subject. But I would first like to thank our panelists, Rafida Abdullah of the Astro Children's Science Program, Clever, Dr. Ahmad Ibrahim of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia, and the Merdeka Award recipients, Dr. Dr. Yahya Awang of IGN, and Professor Lam Saikit of University of Malaysia. Thank you as well to our very first studio audience representing the Young Scientists Network Academy of Sciences Malaysia for their honest observations, suggestions and the questions. And to all of you um, who are watching this program at home or on devices everywhere and anywhere, you're able to because science changed the game. So embrace it and encourage it. Because if we don't, we are ignoring all the possibilities that the world holds. And if we choose to ignore those possibilities, then we wouldn't be the kind of people or nation that we want to be. I'm Bettina Khan. Until the next roundtable, thank you and goodbye.